Thanks, Stephen, for the lovely words of welcome, and thank you particularly, Jane, for the honour and really the joy of launching your book. It's, it's something I've looked forward to, and it's lovely to see everybody. Uh, as I said, the worst thing about Melbourne is that you aren't there, uh, so coming here and seeing you is a great fillip for me. Thank you. When I uh, closed the cover after reading the last page of Jane Fulcher's book, Reclaiming Humility, I scribbled down two sentences on a piece of paper. This is a remarkable book. It doesn't give us a knowledge of something that becomes our possession, but a knowledge of ourselves which becomes our grief. That was my first reaction. But how can you use that to kick off launching a book? Hey, you need to buy this book, it'll bring you grief. <laughs> Who wants that? So I scratched the word out and substituted challenge. This book gives the knowledge of ourselves that becomes our challenge. That's more upbeat, less ominous. Yes, it is. And it blunts the edge of a beautifully crafted scalpel. So let's begin with the other sentence. This is a remarkable book. It is remarkable for its beauty. It's a story beautifully told. And it's a case beautifully put. And it is English beautifully written. And it's remarkable for its courage. Humility is not for the faint-hearted, not in our age and perhaps not in any age. The ancient world regarded it as the opposite of all that is noble, desirable, and honourable. The very antithesis of Aristotle's megalosikos, the great souled man. And in modern times, David Hume mocked it as a monkish virtue, able neither to advance a man's fortune in the world, nor render him a more valuable member of society, neither qualify him for entertainment of company, nor increase his power of self-enjoyment. And the marketeers of our day would add, nor will it open her wallet, if indeed she has a wallet to open. And the book is remarkable for its ability so gracefully to avoid the paradox built into the enterprise itself. The comedians are ruthless. Mac Davis, oh Lord, but it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. <laughs> I can't wait to look in the mirror because I get better looking each day. <laughs> to know me is to love me, I must be a hell of a man. Oh Lord, but it's hard to be humble, but I'm doing the best that I can. <laughs> Or, as Jane has in her book, the famous remark of Lord Longford. In 1969, I published a book on humility. It was a pioneering work, <laughs> which has not, to my knowledge, been superseded. <laughs> and, of course, it's not just the humorists who know the hazards. Jane sized cites Christian de Chergé, the saintly leader of the Cistercian Monastery in Algiers at the time of the brutal assassination of its members by militant extremists in 1969. Dealing with this subject, Christian said, exposes one to the double danger of either daring to speak of humility and exposing one's lack of it or failing to speak of it, and thereby giving the impression that one has arrived. 
Jane, it is an amazing achievement to have written a book on humility which in its brilliance, and it is brilliant, yet manifests so deeply the subject itself. Your work exemplifies the virtue it extols, and that really is something. You won't say it, but I will. But if so much is again it, why do it? Why write a book on humility now? I think I'll duck the now bit of that question for the moment, but why humility? There is a deep resistance to humility in our tradition, as I've mentioned. But there is also a counter stream. The great tragic dramas of the ancient world often pivot on the issue of hubris. Icarus invents wings to fly, but he flies too high. And the sun melts the wax that holds his feathers together and, and he crashes back to the earth. And Sisyphus steals fire from the gods and they cut him down for his arrogance. Pride cometh before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall, says the biblical proverb. Is this memory perhaps a part of the Aussie penchant for cutting down tall poppies? There's something sus about people who are up themselves? So there is precedent, a precedent deeply held in our cultural memory to be wary of humility's opposite. Pride has its dangers. Narcissism often brings destruction in its wake. But beyond all that lies revelation. Our Jewish and Christian heritage sets humility at the center of its vision. God chooses Israel in a situation of slavery, poverty, and powerlessness as the very people through whom God's covenant of mercy, liberation, justice, and peace break into our history. And that turns out not to be an arbitrary choice, disconnected from the nature of the God who made it. For in Jesus of Nazareth, so our tradition holds, God the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And the early believers very quickly saw the implications of that claim, both for their understanding of God and also of themselves. You remember these words. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So Paul to the Philippians, it's not just that God chose Israel enslaved, but in Christ, God takes the lowly road. God does not grasp for might and glory. God chooses solidarity with the marginal and with those who suffer. God humbles God's self and becomes obedient. So Paul says to his flock, let this same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. That really is the world upside down. Whether we think of the Greco-Roman understanding of the good life or postmodern Australia's relentless drive for economic growth, border security, technological mastery and above all winning. 
If Christianity is countercultural, and it is, this is where the rubber hits the road. Jane's book is about humility, to be sure. It's about monasticism, yes. And it's about discipleship, no doubt. But first, and centrally, Jane's book is about God. This book holds a mirror up to us by holding a window up to God. It is called Reclaiming Humility. It could just have easily been called Being Reclaimed by God. This is really good, which means really unsettling theology. How does she go about it? The subtitle of her book answers Four Studies in the Monastic Tradition. If you want to know about politics, come to Canberra or go to Washington or Beijing. Go to the places where political power is concentrated and you see its operation firsthand and close up. If you want to learn about humility, go to the laboratories dedicated to its cultivation. And in our tradition, there is no mistaking where such laboratories are located. Monasteries. Augustine spoke of humility as a virtue which makes it soar above all summits of the world, overturning human arrogance by divine grace. Basil of Caesarea called humility the foundation virtue. I learnt all this from Jane, you know. John Chrysostom said, it is mother, root, nurse, foundation and centre of all other virtues. Monastic life from the beginning is dedicated to the cultivation and living of that vision of truth. In Jane's words, the monastic setting came to mean embracing a way of life, a set of customs or practices designed to establish patterns of behavior and create an inner disposition that would enable one to pursue the goal of single-mindedly seeking God. A couple of things here. Humility is not an end in itself. The true end of human life is seeking God. But since God is revealed in Jesus, who humbled himself and became obedient, humility is the journey that leads to God. It is the school of prayer par excellence. And humility is not just a set of practices, work, worship, study, obedience, poverty, and so on. It is a gift of grace, the disposition of the heart before God and towards other people. But conversely, humility is not just a gifted inward Quality, it's a way of life, a practice, a way of being human in the world. Now, as we know, the monastic tradition is long and it's complicated. And Jane draws on it by telling four stories, or rather series of stories, stemming from key moments and influential figures. And she links a particular aspect of humility with each of the narratives in turn. Not that there are really sharp divisions between the way humility is understood and practiced across the ages, but different times do bring different emphases. She begins with the Amas and Abbas, the mothers and fathers of fourth and fifth century monastic communities in the Egyptian desert. And what a remarkable storehouse of colourful characters and earthly wisdom about the human condition we meet here. Humility and the self is the focus. What does it mean to become a humble person? 
and a breath-snatching journey awaits. The unsuspecting 21st compliant consumerist, me, in this desert laboratory of humility. An invitation to radical processes of unselfing, to use Rowan Williams' striking phrase. And you don't learn that in an afternoon seminar. It is the work of a lifetime. The second of Jane's stations is the towering 6th century figure of Saint Benedict and the communities that stem from his life and teaching. Is that picture gone? <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> uh, I think Jane is at her storytelling best here. And don't miss the wonderful analysis of that famous Giovanni di Consalvo painting of Benedict. Uh, it's here, but it was up there on the wall a minute ago. Leaning across the community table to persuade a visiting raven to remove a loaf of poisonous bread treacherously left by an enemy from the monastery eatery to a place of safety outside. It's terrific. In this chapter, communal aspects of humility are explored. For humility is not just the unselfing of the soul. It is loving service for others. The word became flesh not as a gesture of heroic individual sacrifice, but so that the love of God might be present and practiced in human life. The third station puts us in the 12th century with the life and work of Bernard of Clairvaux. Along with the desert, desert hermits, Bernard knows that there is no route towards God that does not entail a humiliating encounter with human weakness. My human weakness. And with Benedict, he understands that humility entails loving service for others. That's its expression. But Bernard also explores the place of humility in public life, political life. Given the ego-laden solos and occasional duets that ring out from up there on the hill, this is a radical song sheet indeed. But let me not point the finger at Polly's. Listen to Bernard on the power operations of the church. Honour your ministry. Ministry, I repeat, not rule. You will in this way honour it, not yourself. For the man who looks after his own interests in bent, is bent on honouring himself and not the ministry. Hmm. Go Bernard. And finally, Jane brings us right into our own times with the tragic and inspiring story of those Cistercian monks of Algeria. For years, their tiny community lived and served and prayed unassumingly, humbly, with the Muslim society that surrounded them. And then, in the early hours of March 27, 1996, the seven brothers were kidnapped by a group of armed men opposed to their work and faith for 56 days. They were held hostage and then murdered. The impressive film of gods and men tells something of their story. Jane gently spells out the way in which a life of humility in such a context makes possible genuine, supportive and even loving relations between groups of people, in this case Muslim and Christian, who are deeply different and seemingly at odds. This is powerful stuff in 21st century Australia.
Here is a prayer written by Christian de Chierge prior to his capture. A prayer for the man who would become his killer. And also you, last minute friend, who will not know what you were doing. Yes, I want this thank you and this adieu to God to be for you too, because in God's face I see yours. May we meet again as happy thieves in paradise, if it please God, the Father of us both. Remarkable. I know there are criticisms to be made of this long quest for humility, of course. Submission and obedience can easily breed tyranny and oppression. The protests of abused women and children in our time have made that very clear. Service can become servitude, as Nietzsche argued persuasively. Poverty can cripple the body and narrow the soul, as Aristotle knew. And Jane deals carefully and with due solidarity with these voices of dissent. But the effort to reclaim humility remains a challenge for now. Which brings me to grief. Three weeks ago, the World Wildlife Fund released a report on the state of the oceans. It makes alarming reading. Now, I know. I know we've all had it with ecological statistics. I don't want to hear that since 1970, 49% of marine vertebrate life has been lost, that many fish species important to human sustenance have fallen by half, and some important species are now threatened with extinction altogether. I don't want to be told that tropical reefs have lost more than half their reef-building corals in 30 years, and that more than five trillion bits of plastic infest every last corner of the seas. It's too much. What the hell can I do? What I know is I don't want to know. Because I feel grief. I'm implicated in this destruction. This ravaging flows directly from human self-centeredness the incessant desire for more, whatever the cost to other forms of life, whatever the cost to God's earth. And so I will finish with words not from Abba Arsenius of Egypt, or Saint Benedict of Nursia, or even Bernard of Clairvaux, though heaven knows we need to hear them, and we do in this book. But I finish with words of Clive of Canberra, Clive Hamilton that is, the Aussie philosopher who works in the building just over there. <coughs> what do we mean by humility? This is Hamilton. We feel humility when we recognize our own intellectual, physical and moral limitations and acknowledge a power greater than ourselves. It requires us to temper our self-belief, to acknowledge limits to our ability to control the environment, to accept our insignificance as actors in the cosmos, and to abandon the belief that the future is in our hands. In the past, the chief ground for humility 
has been the acceptance of the infinitely greater power of a mysterious and omnipotent God. I am suggesting that Earth system science has revealed that the Earth as a whole, our living environment, is vastly more complex, enigmatic and uncontrollable than we had come to believe. And that taking in these facts causes us to cease thinking that we can master the Earth and to scale back our ambitions. Clairvaux and Canberra, Benedict and Clive, Bernard and Jane. Humility has become a crucial challenge for our times. It's not only personal or monastic or even political. It is now of global significance for the future of God's earth. Thank you, Jane, for this timely book and the healing it offers. Yes, it does cut deep, but with the purpose of a finely crafted scalpel in the hands of a loving surgeon, I declare this beautiful book launched.